this is Barbara Abrash. We're at the Paley Center. It's April 2nd, 2011, and I'm speaking with writer Rose Lehman Goldenberg. Rose, you've had a distinguished career as a writer. Tell a us long how one. A long <laughs> one. Uh, tell us how you started and um, where you took your early training. Well, started in television is different from started writing. I started writing when I was about five, as soon as I could spell, and have been doing it ever since, one way or another. You want to hear how I got into television? It's hard to say because I did some television when I was pretty young, when it was still live television, kin kinescopes, but then um, started doing other kinds of writing, came back to it after I had done plays, stories, books, poems. Playwriting was so much more difficult than anything else, and television was so much more lucrative than anything else, that I guess that's how I put it together. And how did you begin in television? What was your first? Well, I was a new dramatist. I was a playwright, and I was so tired of hearing producers who were then in New York saying, where are the writers? And looking around at the 40 new dramatists who were saying, where are the jobs once produce us? That I actually called people up, people in New York, and said, I'm the program committee of the new dramatists, and we're going to have a seminar. Come. We won't hurt you. You don't have to prepare. And quite a few of them did come. And I was sitting next to a very nice looking man who seemed kind and good and was part of the um, daytime. No, I, that's wrong, really. He was part of the, uh, um, the staff of CBS that put on um, daytime dramas and various kinds of dramas, anyway. And he was kind. People would say, I sent you a script and you never sent it back to me. And he would say, send it again and, and I'll do better for you. And at the end of that seminar, I turned to him and I said, I like you. I want to write for you. And he said, write some outlines. Bring them to me and I'll take you to lunch. And he did and I did. And of the four outlines that I wrote, one actually got on the air as a dumped out pilot. and got great reviews, and I started working off it, and have worked off it pretty much ever since. What was the year that that happened? Well, it turned out that it was 1975, which was right before the bicentennial year, and I gave them an outline about immigrants in New York in 1910, never realizing that they might want a bicentennial program, and they did. So probably that's why it got on. And what was that program? Oh, well, it started out being called Streets of Gold, but that title was taken. So it ended up being called Land of Hope, which I felt was a terrible title. And it ended up being a dumped out pilot, as I said, but got great reviews. It's an odd thing. It's like Mary Poppins coming down in your life finally, and saying, I think you deserve something good. It was a very unusual entry. Nobody knew, <clears throat> excuse me, nobody in the networks knew me. In fact, one of the big executives said, where did you spring from? As though I were a mushroom. And I said, right from your office, waiting for your secretary to let me in to talk to you. And he didn't think it was funny. That was Oscar Katz, actually who was at that time a big name in CBS. So what was it like for women in the business when you came into it that way? Well, there weren't very many. As a matter of fact, in the production of Land of Hope, I insisted that we should have somebody else, some other woman, and so they had a production assistant who lives somewhere on this earth still, was treated very badly, and I was treated very well. but. I saw that being a woman in production at that time was really being a gopher. She wasn't given any serious duties. She had no, no, no function, really, except that I had said we should have a woman. 
in the production. And as a matter of fact, I remember Herb Brodkin produced that show. And he sent out one night for steaks for me and him and the, the director who was George Schaefer. And he sent out for nothing for the staff and saw she was looking at my plate, which was half empty. And he said, would you like this to that woman? I don't think she ever forgot that. So no, it was not easy for women. And what happened after that? Oddly enough, that show, which as I said was a dumped out pilot, got reviews all over the country saying, this is what television should be, who is that writer? Never happened. John O'Connor wrote one of the reviews in the Times. <clears throat> so I started to work. And I worked for practically everybody that was anybody in the business. I worked for Herb Brodkin, worked for David Susskind, I worked for Edgar Sherrick. These were important producers. And since I was a playwright, I didn't know that television writers were not supposed to appear on the set. So I did. I came. And I talked to the actors, and I talked to the directors. It was naivete. Naivete? I know how to spell it. Tell us about some of the shows that you wrote and worked on. Or were they assignments given to you, or <coughs> did you propose them? They, I proposed some, and most of the ones I proposed didn't get on. But um, I did a show called Born Beautiful, which was about models, what it was like to be a model. That was interesting, because I had no idea what it was like to be a model. And what it was like was to have been fat or funny in high school, because no one liked you, because you were so pretty. And when you grew up, you were so still so pretty, but maybe looking in the mirror saying, oh my God, I have a pimple on my nose. The models were just other girls who were extraordinarily beautiful. I did that movie. I did, um, well, ultimately, or not, not ultimately, but finally I did The Burning Bed, which was a great success. And after that, I got so many offers because Everybody wanted a burning bed. Every woman actor wanted to be a star. I did one called Florence Nightingale. She saw Jackie Smith because that was her burning bed, and Valerie Harper wanted me to write something for her. But they were none of them, they were none of them like the burning bed. I never wanted to do the same thing twice. Tell us more about the burning bed because that was such an important piece. The burning bed. Um, was a book by Faith McNulty, and it was about a woman who had actually burned her husband alive, who had been abused, terribly abused by him and her children, and their dog had been abused, and was exonerated. Her name was Francine Hughes, and it was the first time that um, the, the particular kind of um, of crime that she did was seen as, um, how can I put this, as justifiable. Always before, women who murdered their husbands ended up either in the gas chambers, very few of them in the gas chambers, but always in prison. Francine was exonerated, and when this happened, police um, treated domestic abuse as though if they didn't see it, it didn't happen. There were no shelters. She was in a little town outside De Detroit. There were no shelters. There were very few women's groups. After her exoneration and after the movie, women's shelters sprang up everywhere. This film was used as a training film in men's prisons was used as a training film on Indian reservations because one of the problems with her husband was he was drinking and Indians often have wife abuse problems and also drinking problems. So it, it ended up being a really valuable piece of film and I spoke about it a number of times and always someone in the audience would say I couldn't talk about this until I saw the film, or my children never knew 
what happened to me until they saw this film. I'm getting sort of goosebumps when I tell you this. It isn't because of me, because yes, it was a good film, but it was a coincidence. It was a wonderful performance by Farah, very good director. The time was right. It, it was just a remarkable confluence of the right things happening at the right time. So that was the burning bed, and I, I am proud of it. And that received an award, right? Oh, it received every award. Tell it received a reward, oh, an award from the women in film, it received a nomination for an Emmy. I can't even think of it, of how many. Uh, it was w awarded by every woman's group, by every, um, I, don't, I think it was nominated for Humanitas Award. I don't believe it got it, but I have a wall full of them. You were uh, a producer of that, weren't you? I was a producer in name only. That was a way that a writer got a little more money and very little more power. But yes, my, I have a co-producer credit. So these, uh, and you did a lot of, a lot of these uh, scripts, a lot of these productions. A lot of movies of the week and miniseries, yes. And which, uh, which uh, networks were they on? All of them. Uh, in the beginning, when The Burning Bed was written, incidentally, it was written for CBS and it was turned down. Bill Self, who was then, I guess, the head of entertainment programming or whatever, said, we're looking for romantic comedy. I don't know why we even... And Janie Rosenthal, who at that time, I think, was just beginning her career at CBS and is now a very big producer with Robert De Niro, um, I think she was ready to quit over it because everybody that, that knew the script liked it, thought it was really good. But it was turned down. And I had a play that was going to be done in Australia. I went to Australia. I was so horrified that this script that everybody said was the best script in the whole wide world should be tossed aside. It was then offered both to the other two networks, NBC, and as I remember, Brian, Brandon Tartikoff said, I don't believe it. <laughs> and um, whoever was at ABC said, we have already done wife abuse. So the script was dead. I kept showing it as an example of my work, and eventually somebody who had worked with me on something else got enough power at NBC to wake that script up again. And in one, it seems like one day, but it couldn't have been. Um, it was set up at NBC and was done there. Did you ever have a yen to be a director? Yeah, and I had done some directing on stage, but it was not a time when writers and directors became one entity. That is much more common now, and I think writers who want to see their work done as they wrote it often do try to be directors or become directors. I don't quite know how they do that. I think they probably do it by getting somebody really good to be a line producer, because most writers don't know how to do that. So you were having really a wonderful career were there other women who were also having that kind of breakthrough, or were you? There were some. There were some, but I lived in New York. That was unusual too. Many people went to the coast because that's where the work originated. As I say, in the beginning, television was here, but it migrated to Hollywood, where apparently it was easier to get the kinds of um, permissions and whatever that they needed. Now, as you know, a lot of production is done in New York and over in Long Island, but there was a period of time when nothing was done here. Um, I never wanted to live in Hollywood, and therefore, because I'd been a playwright, and because I lived in New York, I think I got better treatment than many writers did. I've heard a lot of bad stories about the way writers were treated, and particularly women writers, and as I say, they weren't allowed on the set. I just went to the set. 
but I think also New York had a cachet then and still does. And we New York writers think we're better. Hollywood writers would say, I can't work here, I have to go to New York because the weather's terrible, you have to stay indoors. Here you go to the beach. So yeah, there was a difference. But you've done some film scripts too, haven't you? Yeah, none of them actually got made, but I did do a movie for uh, Robert Wagner, very interesting subject matter, incest, which again, I thought nobody knew anything about. But as soon as I said the word, somebody would take me aside and say, my mother, my grandfather did that, my father. Um, it's much more common, as wife abuse is, much more common than we knew. But Robert Wagner got kicked out of whatever um, movie company was putting up the money for that, so my script never got done. I did a few movies. I did a wonderful one, I thought it was wonderful, because it was about Jonas Salk and the discovery of polio vaccine. And at that time, there was still great mystery about AIDS. And this was a story of a human being who understood the disease he was fighting and conquered it. And I thought, ah, it's like a paradigm for AIDS. Um, unfortunately, that one, the executive that was our executive got fired. And the second guy never wants to see the first guy's shows go on, so that one died too. But yeah, I, I did write them. Were there any directors that you particularly liked working with? George Schaefer. He was so decent, so good, and actors loved him. Actors loved him, and he did uh, direct Land of Hope, the first one that I did, and at the end of it, he gave me a book as a gift, and in the book, he said, Always, when you were right, and even when you were wrong, you were a pleasure to work with. <laughs> now, George was wonderful, and that was not only my opinion. I think everybody who worked with him knew that. Were you working with an agent? Um, yes, but agents never got me jobs. I usually, from the work I did, somebody would read it with the burning bed, um, Arnold Shapiro, sent the book to me and said, would you do this? And I said, I would kill to do this. I would do this for nothing. I would crawl on my hands and knees to do it. But that's not why I got it, I think. They had sent it to other women writers, and there were women writers, and they were better known than I. And they had been very angry at the husband. And when I read it, I said, this is an American tragedy for him, for her, for the families. This, these were two people who were brought up in a tradition of the man owns the woman, you make your bed and you lie in it. Um, the woman is responsible if the man is bad. Um, he didn't mean it. And that, in a way, was tragedy for both of them. And also, she was smarter than he was, almost always a tragedy. And that was my take on it, and I think that's why I got the job, and I'm so glad I did. Did you ever come up with your own subjects, or were you always doing Yes, but somehow they never got on. I did. I did. There was a little boy um, who had been a, a dwarf. I forget what you call that now, but it's um, a genetic dwarf. He came from an Italian family that was very religious and hid him away. They thought he was some kind of God's, uh, God's, uh, um, well, some terrible thing, like uh, a sin. And a doctor in Italy was stretching people. Yes, it was very painful. I see your look of pain, it was. But this mother told the little boy as he saw his cousins growing up tall around him and he was still little. She told him about this and she said, would you want to go? And he said, yes, I want to grow. That gives me ghost bumps too. It was a wonderful story. They went to Italy. The mother, who had been very limited, became an incredible woman who ultimately was um, a kind of paradigm mother for other mothers with children who had problems. 
And this little boy ended up five foot five, married, had children. I wanted very much to do that story and I couldn't sell it, just couldn't sell it. And I don't think I really, I'm a writer, I'm not a, I'm not a seller. So pitch meetings, I don't think I was all that good. I think what I wrote on paper was why I got work. It sounds like you were not only a pioneer, but kind of a solo act, and a lot of us depend on supportive community. Did you, where did you find your support? Well, um, the Writers Guild and my, the fact that I was married all that time meant that I didn't have to take work I didn't want to do. I could take work that I felt I would really do well and that was good for people, good for women. I didn't, I was offered a death in California and this was put to me as a woman falls in love with her rapist and I said, I don't want to do that. That's not that's not good. First of all, that's not love. Second of all, that's not good. Hitler's childhood was offered to me more than once, and somehow his mother was to blame. His mother had not loved him enough. I didn't want to do that. So I had the luxury of being able to say, no, I don't want to do that. Whereas had I been a single mother or even just single and supporting myself, I think I would have had to say, I'll do whatever I have to do. Did other women turn to you for advice or for help? Or? Not so much individually, but I'd be asked to speak because I was practically the only woman in New York making a living at some of these times. And when I would speak to other women writers, most women younger than me, younger than I, um, they would say, what does your husband think about it? How do you manage to get your housework done? How, what do you children think about it? So I realized that it was hard for women. They had these other concerns. It wasn't just about making a living. It was about living the life of a real woman and at the same time living the life of a real professional writer. Did you feel that you had to balance things? Did you feel the stress of that? You know, when I was writing The Burning Bed, I, I had a little studio up in the attic. We had a house in Teaneck. And my son was a teenager then, and he had a lot of things that he had to deal with, and he would come up and sit until I would notice him, and then I'd say, what's the matter? And he would tell me. And I felt, maybe I'm not giving enough time to my children. And during that period of time, and not because I asked him to, he said, Mom, I'm so proud of you because you're doing what other people only dream of doing and win, lose, or draw, you're doing it. And that meant so much to me that, yeah, my kids were not getting me full time, but they were proud of me. And what about your husband? Well, he was proud of me too. He used to keep scrapbooks about me and he was very successful in business, so I was no I was no thread, I was, I was his wife and I was doing something that he thought was good and got my picture in the paper and, and he was proud of me. You're not writing for television anymore, why is that? Well, the last movie that I did for television was called, it ended up being called Dark Holiday. It started out being called Nightmare in Turkey, and you can see why that Turkey script was not a very good thing. But um, during the course of that, I was working for a director-producer who also considered himself a writer. And some of his comments I felt were apt. And then I saw one of the movies he had written, and I realized he was a terrible writer. But beyond that, at the last, it, w it was starring Lee Remick. It was an Orion film, and there was a money problem. They weren't sure that they could get it on, and a third draft was asked of me, and I said, I signed on for two drafts and a polish, and honestly, I've done a lot more than that. I think you should pay me for a third draft. 
probably I had an agent somewhere who said that, but that was my feeling. And they said, don't worry about it, Rose. The producer will write the third draft if you don't feel that you can do it. And I called up the producer, this director producer, and I said, is that true, Peter? Who shall be nameless, yeah. I said, is that true? Did you say that? And he said, I'm doing it for you, Rose, because you don't want to do it. And I thought, wow, I'm being bullied into doing this. It's like blackmail, but I'm not going to let somebody else write on my script. So I did that draft. We got it on. Lee Remick was lovely in this movie. And I thought, I want to do my best work. I don't want to do this anymore. And I didn't do it anymore. I just didn't. I was offered a couple of things. and. They were none of them things that I would have killed to do. And I started writing novels, and that's what, what I'm doing. What year was that? Oh, gosh. It would have been probably around 1990, maybe. You know, I don't really remember. I'm, I'm guessing that The Burning Bed was aired in 84. This was aired. This one did get on. It was aired, and it was just before Lee Remick got sick and died. She was already ill when she made it, and she was so lovely, and she was so good in it. But I didn't really want to do another movie where I was told, "If you don't want to write this script, why well, we'll do it." You mentioned uh, gathering the writers together. Oh, in yes. the beginning, I, the but, and dramas. I know that you were professionally active. You were active with Writers Guild, weren't you? Oh yes, yeah. yes. I was on the Talk board for years that. of Writers Guild. What kinds of issues were you interested in? Uh, well, actually, interesting that you should ask. The, I was interested in everything, but I was interested mainly in the copyright, because that's why we had no power. The Writers Guild gave up the copyright early on in order to be able to be a union that could negotiate. And it was necessary, writers were writing for nothing. But that was long before I even started writing. But the fact that we have no copyright, that film writers, television writers, radio writers in this country give up their copyright. We have to be employees. We can't even be contractors, we have to be employees in order to have a union that can negotiate a contract. And of course, I'm very interested in unions, but um, because you don't have a copyright, the producer holds, holds a copyright or the network. When they say to you, do this, and you say, I don't think it's good, they say, don't feel bad. We don't want you to violate your integrity. We'll get another writer. It's not yours. It's never yours. And the writers who have these remarkable series like Mad Men are functioning like writers who have copyrights. They're also, I'm sure they do have, I'm sure they've made their kind of deal. But ordinarily, the writer of television, movies, and radio has no copyright and therefore is an employee who can be replaced. So when you were working with, when you were active in Writers Guild, was that an issue that you were That was an issue that I was particularly caring of. And at one point, we were trying to get the copyright, at least in public television. And now that I'm out of the Guild, I, I mean, I'm not out of it as a member, but not on the board. I don't know if that ever happened. But writers who have a lot of clout try to negotiate that. It's, it's like having a child and giving it over to somebody else. And you have no power to hold it. Do you feel that as a writer, you were treated, that men and women are treated in approximately the same way as writers? Or no, they're think? not, and they're not. But I happen to have been treated very well. When I hear the horror stories of some writers and what they go through, I don't know exactly, except for The Burning Bed, in which I was not treated very well. Everything else, uh, I was always treated like a writer, like somebody that really had done something that was unique and wonderful. And 
I, I was very lucky, I think, in my treatment. And I also never felt that I was turned down for anything because of age. I was not able, really, honestly, to join the writers who I believe uh, had a um, suit against the industry because they felt that they had been discriminated against because of age. If I was, I never, never had any feeling that I was. You said that you weren't treated well on the burning bed. You were saying no. That. Well, I don't know how much I really want to talk about that because, um, but it, but it's all true. The burning bed was originally um, developed by Arnold Shapiro, and um, he came to me, uh, offered me this book. I went down to that little town with him, spoke to everyone, although Faith McNulty had already done that. We wanted to know that what Faith thought was the truth of the story was indeed the truth. And Arnold, who wrote and produced Scared Straight, and now has another show on, similar about women and, and teenagers in prisons, um, Arnold is scrupulous about the truth. Then, as I told you, it was turned down by three networks. It was sort of dropped by everyone. And when it came alive again, the then agent that I had offered it to John Avnet. And John Avnet did ultimately direct and produce it, but treated me as someone in his way. So I really had to fight to keep the script the script that was written that he kind of um, lucked into. And it was not the happiest of times. I did a lot of crying, and I'm not a big crier, but I, it was very frustrating. So they were writing on the script. And again, it wasn't my script. Basically, they had bought the rights to it, and they had bought it from CBS, who owned it. I didn't own it. So it was a, an irony, in a way, that, that for all the credits, I have a lot of credits, but that's the one everyone knows. Did you ever feel tempted to work in LA or to go out to Hollywood? Well, I worked there, and I worked for people there, but no, I never was tempted to live there. When did you work there? Well, um, I worked there for Stone Pillow, was out there. It was just before a writer's strike, and they called me out to do another draft there. Um, I met with people there all the time. Most of the producers were there. John Avnet was there. Steve Tisch was there. Everyone at that point in time was there. Edgar Sherrick was in New York, and that was nice. So you mentioned Stone Pillow. Tell us a little bit a little bit about that. Oh, uh, well, Stone Pillow, George Schaefer, who had directed this very first thing that I had gotten on, asked me to work for him a couple of times, even though, <laughs> even when I was wrong, I was okay. Uh, George, I, I don't know what the genesis of it was. When I came into it, Lucy was already involved with it, and Lucy. she, Lucille Ball, and she wanted to do something about the homeless. To do, and she had said um, that she knew Rudin, who was Scotty Rudin's father. I'm trying to remember his first name, but he was a friend of hers. And she had told him that he should open up all his buildings in the Bronx that were empty and give it to the homeless. So that was sort of where we began. And then I had to meet Lucy because she didn't know me. So I did. I went to her house in Hollywood, and or actually in Beverly Hills, and met with her. She was, she was a little sharp with me, but she was nice. She was woman to woman, OK. And she told me what she wanted to do, and she told me that she would like this bag lady character to be uh, like her grandmother and to have a, a fondness for f fruits and vegetables and various things that she told me about her grandmother, and, when that, and that she should have her grandmother's name, which she did. But 
then I wrote the script and everybody thought it was very good and it was an original, it wasn't based on a book or anything. And we shot in New York because that's where the mag ladies were. In those days, now you've got them everywhere, alas, but in those days New York was full of street people and Lucille Ball was very difficult, very difficult. And one of the reasons, I'm sure, was that we shot on the street and people would come up to her and say, didn't you used to be Lucille Ball? At which she would put on some more lipstick and try to get out of her costume or faint. Um, but we got the film made. She did a lot of improvising. She, she, anybody else that had a laugh line or a good line, she'd say, I'll say that. Daphne Zuniga, who played opposite her, was a young actress then, and I don't know how Daphne would tell you about it, but Lucy wanted to give her a line reading for every line. She was very difficult. What are some of the other uh, shows that you did that you think stand out? Um, well, the one about the, about the models, Born Beautiful, got awards too. And um, there was another one that I did with Ed Yashera called Mother and Daughter, The Loving War. Harry Chapin did the music, the songs, and he was actually in it. What a lovely, lovely man. And just a few months after that, he died. He was in an, an automobile accident on the way home to the Hamptons and uh, was killed. But that also got awards. and. It was about the relationship of mothers and daughters over a couple of generations. And I remember there were some very wonderful, memorable moments in it. One of them was um, Edgar called me and he said, I want you to come out to the coast. Um, Tuesday's coming Wednesday, so I'd like you here Thursday. <laughs> but she also, she was playing a mother. She had never played a mother. She'd always played the ingenue. So she was quite difficult, and I had heard that she said to the director, I was a star before you were born, and I'm not going to take acting directing from you. But again, it, it was a very successful movie. It did very well. It won some awards. And it was a touching movie. Frances Sternhagen was in it playing the grandmother. And she had a line where she said, get... Um, I forget the name of what the girl's name was in the movie, but she said, get her a good support bra. And in those days, you had to, you had to have everything, um, every line, every word vetted by the lawyers, the legal department. And there were questions about that line. There was also a question about fetlock. I can't imagine why the, that word was even in the script. Every line had to be vetted. When I wrote the script about Jonas Salk, I lived with him, not literally, but in his house, and learned everything I could from him, interviewed all his brothers, his children. Every line that I wrote in that script, I had to prove where it came from. Either I had to have it on tape, or I had to have a note, or I had to remember, and Actually, line by line, word by word, these scripts had to be vetted. They had to be true. The burning bed was true. And as I say, um, Faith McNulty had done that. But when Arnold and I went down to this little town near Detroit, we took everything down, we taped everything. Now, it seems as though you can say anything about anybody there doesn't seem to be any vetting or any, and I don't know why that is, but in those days, the scripts that were written then absolutely had to be what they purported to be, and I think it's a great loss that that's not still happening. You've mentioned uh, that your shows won so many awards. Yes. Want to talk about what some of those are and which ones matter most to you? Well, I think the one that matters most to me was the one that was the best dramatic script 
that the Writers Guild awarded the year that it was on, because that was my peers, A, and B, that was the script, that was not the film, it was what was on the paper. Was that Burning Bed? That was the Burning Bed, yeah. I was nominated for a couple of them, but the Burning Bed won it. The Burning Bed was also nominated for an Emmy, so we went to the Emmys, which was quite exciting. And I wanted Farrah to win. She was sitting behind me, and I felt she had earned it, but she didn't win. Joanne Woodward won for that year, and I didn't win, but I was glad that I hadn't won, because as I said, I'd had such a terrible time with the producers. I didn't want to get up and thank them. And that's what everybody did. So I was relieved that I didn't win, that I was sorry. I felt she earned it. And it made a big change in her career. I don't know if you saw this, but in that sad and very courageous documentary that she made about her illness, she's on her bed of suffering and some doctor says to her, what was your favorite part? And she said, the burning bed which just proves that doctors can be kind of stupid sometimes. You wrote for some pretty amazing women. Yes. Sarah Fawcett Major, um, Lucille Ball, B. Remick. Were all your scripts about women and were those Well, the Salk script wanted? was not. That's right. Was yeah. that the exception? It was all men. Um, well, uh, there were things that I did about men that didn't get on, and I had a lot of ideas. I wanted to do a Western. I thought I had a very good idea. I wanted to call it Tex Mex. The character was called Tex, and this character called Mex. That didn't get on because they said, no, nobody wants to see Westerns. And then the very next year, of course, a Western got on. Um, no, they weren't. But I think because I was a woman, I was given uh, projects about women. I think they didn't think of me as somebody that would have written a crime movie, but I've been happy to do it. I would, would have liked to have done something different all the time, every time. I know that you've been uh, writing novels and yes. that kind of thing. Would anything lure you back to film or television to write again? The first novel that I wrote was about a dog in Hollywood, a great actor, an actor dog, who tells his own story. And um, he was not only a great actor, but a great lover, as dogs are. And that book, somehow in manuscript, before it was even published, got into the hands of Eddie Murphy, who wanted to play the dog. And um, I wanted to write that script. And at that time, uh, the contract kept coming back with, you can do the first draft. I wanted to, I wanted to, I guess, just to get my chops in movies. And I knew I could do that script. And it ended up that didn't get done either. But I think if I had done that, if I had done that and it had been fairly successful, I'd probably be still writing movies. Because I would think, as I thought in the beginning in television, I can do wonderful things. I can do things that no one else can do. In television, I had learned that I pretty much had to do what was expected of me. And I think I would have had a period of time, and I'm a slow learner, it would have taken time for me to know that probably in movies, I would have done what was expected of me ultimately. But I would have tried to do wonderful things. So um, at the end of this um, long career, it's not quite at the end, but it's no, been no, a long no, time. I'm still writing. I'll always be writing. Um, what would you tell someone coming into the business now? Now, a woman, a woman. Things are much, much better. Um, there used to be a time when you'd look out over the Writers Guild and you'd see not even a tenth of the members were women now, maybe half, maybe slightly less than that. Things are much, much better. You're not any more um, consigned to writing about dogs' fashion. 
Uh, you can write about anything. Women are very tough-minded now. And I think, especially in the theater, um, the credits for women, it's amazing what they are thinking about writing. But I guess I would say for a writer coming into the field, don't let anything discourage you. Everything will seem to be set up to discourage you. It's very hard. Anything where the, where the rewards are great, everybody wants it whether or not they are capable of doing it. It's very hard. The competition is plentiful, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But I think the, one of the valuable things I learned was don't be discouraged by rejection because it is not what you present the first time, it is how you come back. If somebody rejects you and you can come back strongly with what you think was what they wanted or the second draft, a good second draft, if you can write the best second draft that could be written, that's more impressive, I think, than anything you present the first time. And that's a hard lesson, really, but I think I, think I would say that it's one of the truths. I had a script, the one that I wrote for Edgar Sherrick. We went out to California to talk to the executive at the network. And when I walked in, voices everywhere were saying, Rose Goldenberg is here, Rose Goldenberg is here. It was so exciting, I thought I was somebody. And when we sat down, they told me how much they loved my script, but they had some notes, and they gave me the notes. And I went home to write the second draft. But the, the notes, some of them were very specific, like line readings and things. So I said, look, if you can mark up a script, I would, it would be very helpful to me because I may not remember all of these things that you told me. They sent me a marked up script and you know what the script said? It said, this stinks, this is rotten, crap, all over that script. And I remember going to the country with my husband in the car and saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to work for them. They don't deserve me. I'm not going to put up this. And he said, do you want to get your show on? And I said, yeah. And he said, write them a stunning second draft. And I did. And I remember that they said, oh, this is the best second draft I ever saw. And I wasn't all that impressed with that, but the show got on. That was Mother and Daughter. So my husband then, who was a very smart in business, knew already that it's the way you come back. And that's, I think I would, I would try to say that. I've been asking you all the questions. Is there anything you'd like to say as a sign off here? Well, it's an honor to be asked about your life and your career. And I know that my career, such as it is, has spanned so many years that so much has changed not only in our business, and not only for women, but in the world. The world that I grew up in was a much, or seemed to be a much kinder, gentler world. And I think that the, the gains that we made as women have also put upon us more duties, more anxieties, more need to be seemingly perfect. My mother was a fat little housewife by the time she was 34 years old and didn't think of herself as young and pretty. I think now, you know, we can be in our 80s and we still want to be thought of as powerful, strong, capable. Many, many changes. I'm grateful that I grew up at an easier time, but I'm still grateful to be here. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you. Did you get what you wanted? I hope so.